<laughs> some girls might want to read it too they want to see a girl <laughs> girls couldn't read back then tilly <laughs> everyone welcome to byob the bring your own book podcast i'm nikki i'm tilly and i'm kelly welcome to our jrr tolkien mini series we're so excited to delve into middle earth with you this week we're starting at the very beginning with the prelude to the lord of the rings trilogy the classic high fantasy children's novel the hobbit which was first published in 1937 Of course, since then, it's grown into an entire phenomenon, spawning numerous adaptations and fueling audiences' imaginations all around the world. Here's the publisher's synopsis from Tilly. Bilbo Baggins is a hobbit who enjoys a comfortable, unambitious life, but his contentment is disturbed when the wizard Gandalf and a company of dwarves arrive on his doorstep to take him on an adventure. Wow, what a succinct synopsis. Short and sweet, yeah. Yeah. They're like, you know... You know what you're getting into. (laughs) So because uh, this is a mini series and these books are so old, we're not going to be doing first impressions. We're really just going to dive in. But before we do that, we just want to talk a little bit about what editions each of us are reading because there are so many out there and that can influence your experience a little bit. So Tilly, why don't you tell us about your edition of The Hobbit? Sure. So this is not the first edition of The Hobbit I ever read, actually. I originally grew up reading my dad's edition of The Hobbit, which was much older. Um, This one I bought in university. It says it's uh, HarperCollins UK. It says it was published in 1998, but I definitely did not buy it in 1998. Uh, It's very cute, good font sizes, and has little illustrations um, above each chapter heading. So I very much enjoy it. And uh, got that dragon horde on the front cover with smog, you know, just like slithered all around it. What about you, Kelly? So I was actually gifted The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings trilogy in a box set for Christmas last year. So thank you very much. Um, And I have the 2012 paperback editions where they all have the black covers with different designs on them. And this has a few illustrations throughout the book. But, um, yeah, I think it was, this version's originally from, like, 1995, potentially, from HarperCollins Publishers. And, yeah, it's a cute little paperback. It's great. (laughs) Awesome. And I recently gifted myself the special edition (laughs) box set um, from HarperCollins in... That was published in 2020, and this has artwork from Alan Lee, who did the concept art for the Peter Jackson films. Mm. So Mm -hmm. it has original watercolors almost in every chapter. It's beautiful. The um, cover for the book is uh, the Baggins Hobbit Hole. (laughs) Oh, yeah. But these are not the first ones I've read. Yeah, they were a sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a good thing I already knew I liked yourself. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So we're going to start talking about this a little bit. So I am I kind of am interested to hear what Kelly thinks first, just because Tilly and I have more experience with reading this book than she does. This was a, a first time for her, her first impressions. She's a newbie. Yeah. <laughs> so... Kelly, why don't you start us off on this glorious journey? (laughs) Well, it was not as long as Bilbo's journey, thankfully. (laughs) Because, yikes. Um, I had a lot of fun. I was very nervous going in, but you both told me, don't worry, it's pretty accessible because it was written for kids. So I'm like, okay, okay, I'm ready to go. Um, And yeah, it was not hard for me to understand, which I was like, thank God. God, because I was like, how am I going to get through the next three if I can't even get through The Hobbit, you know? Um, But yeah, I had a good time. I ended up giving it a three and a half out of five just because I kind of had to grapple with, you know, the fact that I know this was written way, way long ago in the 30s and styles have changed since then, like just like literary styles or narrative styles have changed a bit. 
Um, and it was written for children. So I'm reading it as an adult in 2022. So I just was like, okay, Kelly, and remember it's for kids. It's not written for you, you know? <laughs> so I still enjoyed it, but I did find it was like a little different than what I expected in terms of like the mm. style of narration, like where J.R.R. Tolkien at times, it seems like he's literally talking to you or to the child that's reading, which is kind of fun. Just not what I expected. Um, but yeah, I had a pretty good time and I have seen the full Hobbit trilogy movies. Um, I don't know how the hell they turned this into a trilogy. I didn't know how they did that I know. when I first heard it was a trilogy because I'm like, this book is tiny. <laughs> but yeah, so I was trying to like... Yeah, they took things from like the unfinished tales and stuff like oh, that too. Yeah to put in there the supplement okay yeah, yeah because i kept trying to remember how the movie went when i was reading this and like there were certain things i knew for sure okay i definitely don't remember that in the movie and then some things i was like what <laughs> you know <laughs> like what happened so yeah because i've i've seen the lord of the rings trilogy many times whereas this one i've only seen it once so it didn't bother right. me too much but yeah i enjoyed it Good. Nice. What about you, Tilly? How many times have you read this? What's your count now on this book? Oh, I think it must be, this must be my fourth or fifth time this reading it. I oh. definitely read it on my own as a kid. I definitely read it out loud to my sister also as a kid because I loved it so much. And we have a four-year difference, so I was reading aloud to her before she could read herself. Mm -hmm. um, or before she could, like, read a whole book herself. And I've definitely listened to it as an audiobook on long car rides. My family used to go visit family, uh, like, eight hours away every year. And we would often listen to The Hobbit or Lord of the Rings books, because they're great for a long car ride. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also read it in university because I actually studied it in a class. I had a class It was about monsters and philosophy. Oh. And so we studied a bunch of different um, monsters in books. And this one had trolls and also dragons. So it was like a really great um, book to study and talk about monsters. So I was delighted to read it in university. Delighted to read it again now. Um, I, I gave it a five star out of five because it's just so nostalgic for me. It has like a lot of <laughs> important meaning. So I was just smiling the whole time I was reading it. So I also a couple of years ago also played The Hobbit uh, GameCube video game from 2003. <laughs> so uh, I played through it with my partner and we kind of like took turns going at being Bilbo and like going to do all these things and all these little puzzles and everything. So anyway, the story is very, very familiar to me. Oh and I had uh, a great time rereading it. I was really struck because I haven't read it since I saw the Hobbit trilogy, which mm -hmm. like you, Kelly, I was like, how the hell are you going to stretch this yeah. out? I'm kind of of two minds on that whole um, debate. My partner is very anti the movies because he's like, I refuse to give the money. It's just a money grab. Like they don't <laughs> need to make it into three movies. It's a tight 90 minute story. Yeah. Um, which I kind of agree, but I did like that they incorporated a lot of like Tolkien lore. And for somebody, I haven't read the Silmarillion. I haven't read a lot of his other kind of like external works. So I was really interested to see how they supplemented it and kind of like made it bigger. Um, and I was also really struck in rereading this book, how little time actually takes place in each place mm -hmm. like in the um the goblin like mines in my head that's such a big long scene because they made such a big deal about it in the movies which it should be it's cinematic it's like an extremely exciting time like meeting the goblin king and like <laughs> there's all these dramatic things that are happening and in the book it was like three pages <laughs> it <laughs> took so little time i was so like wow wait i want to go back i want to find out more so yeah. um yeah i guess sorry i kind of like rambled a little bit all over the place yeah. there but i had a great time rereading it <laughs> And you played the Hobbit video game before the movie. So it's not even like a movie tie-in. It's like, let's just take this book and turn it into a video game. <laughs> That's really cool. I, know. <laughs> I love that. Awesome. Yeah, I think this was my fifth time reading The Hobbit. But it's my first time reading The Hobbit since I've become a full-fledged adult. So, <laughs> congrats. So <Scary. laughs> it um I think the last time I read it I was like 13 or I don't know how old I was when the movies came out. I think I might have read it before that. 
Mm. just to refresh even though i remember going in to see the movie and watching it and being like a lot of this stuff was not in the book (laughs) i'm kind of with aaron on the it should have been a tight 90 minutes uh (laughs) well and there's a a movie from the 90s i think uh, an animated hobbit movie from the 90s that was like very short and very oh my god there's some banging songs in that oh (laughs) yeah (laughs) rocking it's a good time (laughs) Anyway, (laughs) but I, reading this now as an adult, I did give this a four to five just purely for like nostalgic purposes. But other than like reading it and being like, oh, I remember what this felt like when I was little. The most exciting part about reading this book for me was thinking about how Tolkien was a philologist which is Mm. someone who studies languages. Mm -hmm. So he makes Mm -hmm. up a lot of funny words in this. A lot of things are things of his own invention. Even the way that he writes dwarves and how that's not how you're actually supposed to spell it, but he spells it wrong throughout the whole book. And now it's kind of just like accepted in the world. (laughs) I think that's so cool. And it's also really interesting to think about that because in The Lord of the Rings, He doesn't really do that, and he actually tries very hard to never use any language that was created after the 1500s. So the I didn't know that. Interesting. Yeah, the balance between the two, and I'm so much more familiar now with the trilogy than I am with The Hobbit, and looking at the evolution of that and seeing how this very simple story um, got kind of pulled apart and made so much bigger than itself Mm -hmm. to become the trilogy was the part that was the most exciting for me to be like oh yeah this is this is how they went around this loophole and this is how they went around this thing to re-explain and put them into this world of sauron so yeah i wonder that's really interesting about the language i wonder if he did that because the Hobbit is a kid's book, so he wanted to like be a bit sillier and have a bit more like creative license, I guess, in a way. And then he just decided, no, I'm going to keep it a bit more formal, if you will. I don't even know, because I've not done <laughs> that book yet. <laughs> but you know what I mean? It's like very Dr. Seuss of him, I feel like, to just make up yeah. whatever he wants. <laughs> Well, through his letters, we see that as he was writing The Lord of the Rings, it wasn't initially intended to be like a book for adults. But as he was writing the story and diving more into mythology that he was creating and mythology that he had created before writing The Hobbit, he just grew to understand that the story was darker. Mm -hmm. And so he kind of just made that shift within himself to go this more, I guess, adult, if you will, root or road with the the trilogy and those things just kind of fell out. But you do still see songs and everything like that in the trilogy. It's just a little bit more serious. There isn't all of the kind of um, quirky, um, like silliness of the stuff in The Hobbit, which I personally didn't miss at mm-hmm. all. But (laughs) oh, I miss it. I mean, that's something I think that I really struggled with when I was younger and trying to read the Lord of the Rings trilogy for the first time after having read The Hobbit, because I loved the kind of like fairy tale aspect of The Hobbit and the humor and the kind of like bumbling good naturedness of all of the characters. And then going into The Lord of the Rings, where it starts out like that in the Shire, but then there's this thread of darkness through the whole trilogy that I think really kind of put me off reading it as a younger person. Now I can appreciate it much more. And as an adult, that's what I love about the movies is like the drama Mm -hmm. and the darkness. But that's what I love very much about The Hobbit. And that I think makes it hold such a special place in my heart is that it's so, um, it's so lighthearted, even when there, I mean, I just said this in the last episode we recorded, but we'll, we'll make it sound good. But even when there's difficult things that happen, I mean, like Thorin Oakenshield dies at the end oh yeah it it doesn't feel like a major character died at the end it feels like a happy tale that everyone learned something from and like everyone kind of ended up happily even though they didn't they literally didn't yes and i want to quickly talk about these 
characters, just the names, okay? Okay, go for because it. Because I will say, I, this is where I was like, this is for kids. This is for kids. Because otherwise, I was about ready to be like, could you like crack open a baby name book? Or it's just, I don't know, a thesaurus? <laughs> like, I don't know, something. <laughs> because I have, a, I have a funny name story to go along with this. So okay. please continue. So here are the dwarves, okay? Ballin, Dwallin, Biffer, Boffer, Bomber, Dory, Nori, Ori, Philly, Killy, Owen, Glowin, Thorin. Okay, and the names that sound like each other, oh, wouldn't you know it, they're related to each other. So, <laughs> little old me. It would be weird if they weren't. Yeah, I was like, Philly and Killy are brothers? Go figure, you know? But <laughs> I understand they're dwarves. They probably have different... Yeah, they different naming conventions. Yeah, but I was just like, what? As we kept meeting them, I was like, wait a sec. <laughs> But it's okay. Yeah. I, um, so I had never listened to the book. I listened to The Hobbit, the Andy Circus version yes, um, for this read through. And so the first time I ever heard these names pronounced or any, any names were the original Lord of the Rings movies. And in, the second movie, The Two Towers, when <laughs> when Aragorn and Gimli and Legolas meet Theoden's nephew on the way to Rohan, he introduces Legolas. He says, this is Gimli, son of Gloin. <gasps> so that's how I thought it was pronounced. But Gloin's dad, Gloin is son of Groin, but it's <gasps> Groin. If oh, you no. pronounce it <laughs> Gloin. And so I remember reading these books when I was younger and being like, that is the most unfortunate name ever. <laughs> and then when I was listening, <laughs> listening to the, the uh, thing, I was like, that makes a lot more sense. Oh my Glowin, God. It makes sense, but I also Rowan. refuse to accept it because I grew up pronouncing the names as Oin and Gloin yeah. and Beefer and Bofer and Feely and Keely. Like I have my own pronunciation that's so ingrained in my head that I refuse to learn anything else. <laughs> I, I don't care if that makes someone want to fight me. You can fight me on it. That's like, well, apparently, I'm just anticipating some diehard, diehard Lord of the Rings fans. Diehard. Like, You're supposed to. Die well, hard. <laughs> the name Gloin is derived from Norwegian mm. and they actually don't have an oi sound mm. in Norwegian. So it yeah. has to be glowing, but <laughs> because I want to hear that <laughs> they didn't, I don't know. the The authority on this matter wasn't there the day they shot that scene. <laughs> Forever, it will say, "This is Gimli, son of Gloin." I'm sorry. And I thought about it the whole time. I'm sorry, <laughs> I was like, "Wait a sec, Peter Jackson." Wasn't he the authority, Mr. I think he had other things on his mind. He's directing the movie. <laughs> I understand. He's the I'm big Tolkien you, fan. I'm just saying, yeah. Maybe it was right <laughs> after Vigo Mortensen broke his toe kicking the helmet and he was so concerned about him he didn't have time to correct his pronunciation. <sighs> or maybe it was right after Vigo Mortensen threw open the doors and then he was like blown away, his, his breath was taken away <laughs> and he had no, you know, no brain cells left to compute anything because that's how I feel every time that happens. I know it's a different movie. I, I got to rewatch it. I just wanted to say it. <laughs> but also, if you if you went by groin, it brings a whole new meaning to, like, the fruit of my loins. Like, the fruit of groin. <laughs> the fruit of groin. <laughs> groin and groin. Oh, my God. Whoa. You're okay. welcome, Nikki. I know Tolkien doesn't want us to impose any metaphor onto his work, but I'm going to impose that one. <laughs> Thank you. Except Christianity. He does want that one. That's But true. groins, yes. <laughs> Another thing. There's no hidden meaning. Okay, then explain this. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing oh, I wanted to quickly mention about the characters was it wasn't until the end of the book that I was like, wait a second, did we not meet any women in this book? <laughs> like, yeah, okay. I 
also thought about that. But what I noticed very early on was, and I'm going to read it to you because it really stuck out to me. There was a very brief mention of page 13 of my of my edition. As I was saying, the mother of this hobbit, Bilbo Baggins, that is, was the famous Belladonna Took, Mm -hmm. one of the three remarkable daughters of the old Took, head of the hobbits who live across the old water, the small river that ran at the foot of the hill. And I'm like, where's that story Mm -hmm. of those three remarkable daughters, one of whom is named Belladonna? Yeah. Incredible name. Yeah. Like, where come how how dare you just tease this little sprinkle and then have no more women? They took it away. He's like, I'm a man's man. Gotta talk yeah, to the, the only men. Man, the women we can talk about is a mother. <laughs> I did. I was like, "What do you mean? There's no female dwarves? What about an orc? What about anything? Not even the friggin' spiders were women. I mean, they wouldn't be women, but female. But like, not even the spiders were girls. None. What? <sighs> it's because lady spiders wouldn't be that stupid. That's true. They'd be there eating and all we the see men them later. <laughs> <sighs> <laughs> but I, I agree. It does seem just so, like, statistically improbable. Yeah. And and so much so that it's like, okay, it's really, you're really making an effort now to make sure all of these characters are male yeah. the way you are male, J.R.R. And yeah. I take issue with that. Yeah. The, some girls might want to read it, too. They want to see a girl. <laughs> girls couldn't read back then, Tilly. <laughs> oh, God. We can't read now. That's silly of me. <laughs> yeah. What is reading? What? That's why I had to use the audiobook. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> We're all just lying to you. We've never read any of these books. We just guess based on the pretty pictures. <laughs> Did you ever see that meme? It was like a 1950s propaganda commercial of this little girl trying to sound out a book. And she was like, the, the cat, cat in the, fuck this, I'll be a stripper. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> I love strippers that. can read yes. and i'm sure they read a lot so hey but i they just can do like math what? really well i'm assuming <laughs> yeah yeah they can Quick math. get it yeah <laughs> tolkien's like what are you talking about <laughs> literally rolling stained my reputation <laughs> we're doing it right <laughs> you know what our intention with this series was to show our listeners a different side of the Tolkien fandom. Yeah. And I feel we're accomplishing that already. I hope yeah. so. Because that was part of the reason I was so intimidated by these books. I just felt like, obviously, like you both have read, if not the whole series, parts of the series. And so I know that it's not just for boys, if you will, but a lot of the fans can be pretty gatekeepy and like... Yeah. It's just intimidating, especially my experience was similar to yours, Tilly's, where I tried to read Lord of the Rings as a kid, and I was like, I can't do this. I think I was just too young. But I'm reading, I mean, I'm working on The Fellowship of the Ring now, as we're recording this, and I'm understanding it, and I don't feel dumb. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. there's no reason you, you wouldn't. And yeah, I think a lot of the time, the most vocal people in a fan base are like the the big the loudest voices are the ones that are heard yeah and i think it's unfortunate that a lot of the time there are people who think you can only read this book if you know every single thing that has ever happened in the author's life and then that's the only way you're a true fan and that's some bullshit because you can enjoy all sorts of things at any level of experience yeah yeah i mean i I know a lot more now than I used to, mm-hmm. but I didn't start delving into like the history behind it or um, like Tolkien's personal history with the books until I was probably like 20. Mm-hmm. So that's a and good portion of my life. Yeah, that's a good portion of my life where I just enjoyed the stories for what they were. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know every back background thing like there were words that i would read and i'd be like yeah i know this is a thing but i don't really know what it is but it didn't really affect what was happening so it didn't matter Mm -hmm. as much so like you don't have to know anything about any background to enjoy this yeah take it from me i only saw the movies (laughs) listeners so (laughs) and i did it (laughs) (laughs) you sure did you had a great time i I, uh, even at the beginning, when they showed some of the um, elven runes, I was trying to decode it with the few symbols they gave me in the prologue. 
and I got like half of it. And then wouldn't you know it in like the third chapter or something, they told you what it said. And I was like, I was so but close. You still got the satisfaction of having almost cracked the code. Yeah. <laughs> that actually reminds me, I was recently um, helping my mom clear out her basement and there were a lot of like Tupperware totes of like old memorabilia. And uh, one of the things I found was this Hobbit journal that was like very beautiful and had all these like original, like oh, not original, but all these beautiful watercolors in it. And it was like, you know, trademark merchandise. And I opened it up and was like, what did I put in here? Because knowing myself, I was pretty, pretty heavily expecting it to be totally blank because I was too nervous to like write anything in this beautiful book. <laughs> um, no, I opened it and I had carefully transcribed all the runes with a calligraphy pen and also all of the like signal uh, symbols around the ring I had carefully transcribed. Then I'd also written down several of the um the songs it was like a very on theme and i sent a picture to both of you because i thought it was so cute and then nikki you told me that i have the exact same journal (laughs) i have no idea where it is now but i was also really nervous to write in it i think i had it for maybe three years before anything went in it because i was so terrified and I think I probably did a similar thing, just of course, because you don't want to ruin the theme. <laughs> I want to know, I'm curious, what part was your favorite in the book? My favorite um, was with Bayorn. And oh, yeah. for some reason, um, while I was listening to this, I don't know if it was the narration or whatever, but it really... The character really reminded me of York Bernison from The Golden Compass. Oh, yeah. I really of felt that they were like very um like symbiotic the characters. This kind of like grouchy, I don't talk to anybody, leave me alone, I don't have time for this kind of thing. And I loved it. It made also I think, a bear. Yeah. <laughs> right? When um yep. When I was younger, my favorite part was with the trolls. Yes. And that was like super great. But then reading it this time, since I've read The Golden Compass, I was like, yes, this is it. I love <laughs> Bayorn. It's great. Can we talk about the trolls quickly? Because yeah. I was like, Gandalf, can you like step in quicker? Like, what? A- he was a troll. <laughs> he was trolling the trolls, okay? He waited till the last second to help the dwarves out and i'm like they could have been eaten <laughs> like oh god <laughs> i know yeah so dramatic <laughs> i think that one Sorry. of the funniest things about this book is that bilbo never really actually like like does anything it's just all <laughs> pure luck yeah like he has the ring <laughs> and it's just all luck even the situation with the trolls him he and gandalf don't actually like do anything to them Mm -hmm. he just distracts him them long enough and then the sun (laughs) happens to come up and they're like (laughs) turned to stone but i think when you're in it you don't really realize that this is just kind of like the perfect storm of events rolling through and then i got to the end and i was like oh and i'm like that's the kind of luck I feel like I would have if I was on one of these adventures because no one wants to be like, yeah, I'm the person who would die like before we even made it out of the Shire. Um, so that's the kind of luck I imagine I would have. That convenient right place, right time kind of thing. Also, I don't think Bilbo ever actually says, yes, I will go on this journey. They're just like, haha, don't worry about it. <laughs> That's true. He's kind of like just grabbed by the shirt sleeve and he's gone. Yeah. Without um, even a just handkerchief. Going back, oh, yeah, his handkerchief. Just going back to Nikki, you were talking about um, Bayorn. He gave me strong um, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight vibes. Oh. I recently watched The Green Knight. Oh, my God. The new oh, movie yeah. with Dev Patel, which was such a trip. <sighs> um, but I also had been thinking about reading the poem in university mm-hmm. and there was that character who I think also did turn into a bear and was like the, the keeper of the house. And yeah, that's what I was getting when I was on this reread. So that was really fun. Um, just thinking about favorite, uh, favorite sections. I think my, 
I think my, like Nikki, I would have said if I was younger, I would have said the trolls because that was a part I had a really visceral response to as I was reading. It was like, oh yeah, the trolls. And I love that their names are William and Bert and like Tom. It's so funny to me. Like such blue collar names and they have like the most blue collar accents too. It's crazy. (laughs) They're so silly. Um, But I think my actual favorite part is, is Bilbo talking to Smaug Mm -hmm. and just like all the um, kind of ways that he figures out how to manipulate the dragon's own ego against him Mm -hmm. which i read a lot of books about dragons very into dragons and i love this idea of them being like very very intelligent but that their ego trips them up a lot Mm -hmm. and that's Mm -hmm. i think what often comes up in these sorts of books like i recently reread the the two princesses of bamar by gail carson levine which is <laughs> yes. not at all similar except that it has a dragon <laughs> who also gets foiled by her own ego and i really loved reading that this time it's a female dragon yeah <gasps> there's so many women in that Kelly book would love it <laughs> yeah there's two princesses <laughs> one dragon <laughs> I yeah, I really did enjoy him talking to Smaug. Is it Smaug? Smog? Smog. I always say Smaug, but maybe that's me being pretentious. I don't know. <laughs> I honestly don't know. I liked him talking to the dragon. <laughs> it was pretty yeah. fun. I hmm. I think my favorite part. Uh, I also really liked Bayorn. I just I loved all of the dwarves coming him coming in and him being like what oh, yeah. there's more oh okay oh okay Just there's more oh, okay you know <laughs> <laughs> i really loved that but i think i also surprisingly really loved was it the old forest um i did mm. not like the spiders at all shocker but i thought it was written very very well and super atmospheric and i wanted to know more mm-hmm. about what is happening in these woods like what are they hearing? Are they actually seeing elves? What's going on? Um, so I thought, yeah, I wanted to spend more time there. Uh, and I also really enjoyed the chapter with Gollum because I want to know more about Gollum. Yeah. Yes. He's so That's interesting. A great yeah. And all the wordplay and like the riddle the riddles in the dark. Yes. Oh my god. And how he tricks him at the end. I mean, the way that Bilbo gets the ring is not really by following the rules at all he didn't tell a riddle he told like an open-ended question (laughs) which Gollum (laughs) answered so he was kind of locked into the contract Mm -hmm. but it's so interesting to me that you know I think Bilbo feels very entitled to the ring Mm -hmm. as like I won it fair and square but he really didn't no no it's it's another situation of Bilbo being like super lucky because yeah it's just because Gollum finally decided to give up and say, okay, but I get three guesses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And why would he guess that he had the ring in his pocket? Because Gollum thought the ring was perfectly safe on his little island. (laughs) Yeah, his little island. (laughs) His sweet little cave island. Oh, God. I pictured the cave (laughs) in Harry Potter. Do you love Gollum? (laughs) Pardon? Nikki, do you love Gollum? I am Gollum. Why did you say that? No, you are not. <laughs> I rebuke it. <laughs> I won't allow sure? it. I will stop you. I live in a basement. I Listen. only see you guys. And I only leave to eat. So <laughs> that sounds I think like Gollum. Arguably, in the pandemic, every one of us is a Gollum. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> but we haven't resorted to eating fish like raw yet. So no. that's, that's a win for me. That's also true. Sushi. Whenever I, I think about him, Sorry. I don't eat sushi. But whenever I think about him, I think about him smacking the fish on the on the Ugh. rock I know. in the movie. <laughs> I um something I was really surprised about when I was reading that Gollum chapter was they said that he referred to himself as precious and not the ring, mm. which I was like, whoa, what is this? But then I was like, wait a second. Does he, like, think he's the ring, kind of? Because there's certain moments where you're yeah, like, probably. he's clearly talking about the ring and not himself. But he says precious. You know what I mean? So I thought that was really mm-hmm. surprising yeah. and interesting. <laughs> yeah, I think he's just losing his mind a little bit. And I think you're right. I think there's a part of him that is kind of 
seeing himself and the ring and his other self like his mind is just splitting apart in different directions Mm -hmm. for having had the ring in his possession for so long and i think yeah he like his identity and the ring's identity is kind of mixed for him Mm -hmm. yeah because he does talk about the ring as himself he also talks about the ring as his master Mm -hmm. and talks Mm -hmm. to himself like Gollum talks to himself as Smeagol about the ring as mm-hmm. this third entity that mm-hmm. is um showing them the way. Yeah. So there's a lot of a lot of different things happening there. Yeah. But I like I get so grossed out, but also love it whenever <laughs> Gollum's around. Yeah. <laughs> in these books. <laughs> I was really interested. I was reading it. Um, they talk at one point very briefly about the White Council drawing out the necromancer from Mirkwood. And I was reading that and I, my partner was in the room and I was like, is the necromancer Sauron? And he was like, yes. And he was so excited to tell me about it. And I was like, no, no, don't spoil. I'll get there. <laughs> um, be, but I don't think that's ever really explained in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And Nikki, maybe you can talk about it. Is that a story somewhere else that we can read? You get a little bit of Sauron's backstory, but the way that it evolves, because Sauron didn't exist in The Hobbit. Mm. Right. So how how The Hobbit evolved into the trilogy is that he created this backstory with Sauron and the ring, and becoming invisible became like a side effect of wearing the ring, not the ring's Mm. purpose. Because mm-hmm. Sauron wears the ring, but Sauron doesn't turn invisible when he wears it because he's already dead. He's already a wraith, like he's this other entity. So we, Sauron, <laughs> okay, Sauron, Sauron was originally an elf. <gasps> and in the most basic sense, Ale, who's the god, created elves and dwarves and men and hobbits everything he is yeah he is god like the christian god mm-hmm. ale he created elves and then so sauron was at one point this real hot elf dude and then he turns <laughs> bad and shit happens and he ends up in that darth vader-esque suit as the oh. the man of death himself and they so chop the finger that's off. like it's yeah that's its right. own like really okay. long story that maybe I'll get more into like in later episodes. Okay. But so it's just important to know that like all of the stuff that's like talked about in the Hobbit, though it is connected possibly, possibly at some point in the trilogy was not all necessarily meant to connect. So, Mm. right. So like the author didn't have that all figured out yet when he wrote the Hobbit. No, That's where, so when we were doing the Instagram questions, I asked, do we think that Bilbo would have used the ring so much if the the implications from the trilogy were in at play in The Hobbit? Because we see in the trilogy, when Frodo puts the ring on, he goes into the Wraith world. And mm-hmm. he's in this kind of like in-between spirit world, shadow land kind of thing. Now, that's not fun. Like, (laughs) nobody wants to do that unless you want to end up like Smeagol, I guess. But so that was kind of the, the like root of that question. But then I realized Mm -hmm. as people were answering that they maybe didn't have enough of the backstory to answer the question quite in the way that I had like intended it. (laughs) Right. Um, I definitely didn't. (laughs) I I don't think I did either. Yeah. (laughs) So the ring is just. It's just a ring for invisibility in The Hobbit, but it has, like, so much more going on through the trilogy that wasn't wasn't even thought of at that point. Okay. That's so exciting to hear you talk about because now I'm like, oh my gosh, there's all this new stuff that I can kind of understand a little bit better and, like, learn more about and kind of, like, all these new layers to peel back, like an onion. <laughs> yeah, um, like an ogre. Another famous classic, you know, <laughs> Shrek. <laughs> Yeah, so the um, you see, like, even, like, transitioning into the trilogy where we've all just finished the first quarter of The Fellowship, and Gandalf talks about, oh, I'm, like, figuring this stuff out. Mm-hmm. 
Right. But in the movie, you don't see him figure it out because it's common knowledge. And that was the way the movie, like, got around the fact that, like, no one actually knew anything when yeah. Hobbit was being written. Because <laughs> he just goes, yes, this is what the ring is. I wonder if they have any, any more info about Gollum slash Smeagol in... I know they talk about him a little bit in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, but I'm curious if he's in, like, the other books that are in the Middle Earth universe because I feel like he's just so bizarre and so upsetting. And, like, there's got to be a story behind that. I want to know. Because even when I watched the movies growing up, even though I was, like, creeped up by him and kind of disgusted <laughs> by certain things, I was always so interested to figure out, like, how did this happen? And what are you? Because they say he's kind of like a hobbit, but they don't even know. So yeah. Well, he was he was a store hobbit. This is all explained in the first part of the fellowship. He but was they don't a have... store hobbit, which is a river hobbit. Okay. And he sees the ring in the water and his mm -hmm. cousin dives in and gets it and he kills his cousin because it's his birthday and he thinks that he should have the ring. And the ring has just corrupted him so much over time that he's turned into this like other thing. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I wonder like, did J.R.R. Tolkien write anything specifically about him through, like, his perspective or following him? Mm. Or is it just the info we get from Gandalf secondhand? You know what I mean? I don't know. You know, I'm not really mm. sure. I haven't read the entire Silmarillion, mm. but I don't think so off the okay. top of my head that's part but i could of the be really wrong yeah. of Gollum, though yeah like he's been know. he's been alone for so many years like people see him just his actually people really don't boring. see him <laughs> because it took him forever to leave the mountain true so yeah, his story would just be like i woke up it's dark um <laughs> ate a fish <laughs> killed some people to myself, snuck up on the them <laughs> yeah <laughs> made a new yeah. riddle <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> took me three days to come up with it, but I think it's a good one. <laughs> Did anybody else find the chapter in Rivendell? Is it Rivendell? Rivendell. I was, I was like, oh, they're going to the elves. I was so excited. And then they were like, we're not going to talk about it because nothing really bad happened. And we don't want to hear about all the fun, pleasant stuff. So let's just like move along to the end of their trip. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> like the end of the visit. Know, that was just another situation where it was like, I was excited about the place. Mm -hmm. And Tolkien was like, you don't get to hear about it or spend any time there. Yeah. Just imagine it really briefly and spend hours thinking about it. But I'm not going to tell you about it. <laughs> but we had yeah. to figure out the rune message. That's why we went there. Because I was halfway to cracking right. the code. But I didn't get there in time. <laughs> you didn't know about the like the moon letters, though. So that's, you know. True advanced level <laughs> that's not on you yeah. true <laughs> that's the advanced code cracking <laughs> the fbi teaches that course <laughs> one of our questions on instagram to fellow readers for this readathon was would you rather be a hobbit elf or dwarf and i want to talk about that right now because the hobbits won pretty easily on instagram yeah and i was kind of surprised i was expecting more elves really? honestly yeah I picked an elf. <laughs> I want to be in a hobbit. All I want to do is like live in a cottage, mm. be in nature, wear comfy clothes, and eat like lots of bread and drink tea and have no one talk to me unless I want them to. Oh, that does sound good. Especially the bread. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But like. Yeah, but when you're an elf, you get to be hot and comfortable because you're always wearing like nice linens. <laughs> like hot sexy not hot hot because you're wearing linen right True. so you'd be like really cool and it'd be breezy and <laughs> you get all of this really beautiful architecture and then when you're just like tired you can be like i'm just gonna jump that ship to valinor i'm out of here Und undying li lands here i come like that sounds ultimately superior and also your feet aren't really hairy so oh, maybe true. that's just me i fucking hate feet so. <laughs> same 
but i i understand i do not agree <laughs> but with, with all of your elf reasoning the feet thing i'm like i'm neutral on, but yeah <laughs> but you also if you're an elf you get to be around orlando bloom and oh my god i'm gonna forget his name now <gasps> from the hobbit movie what's his name oh yeah from oh yeah he's hot. the guy oh, who like plays lee garrett pace. in uh twilight <laughs> Lee Pace? Lee Pace. Yeah. He's in Twilight? Yeah, he plays Garrett, the the nomad guy who comes to help in Breaking Dawn. Um, oh, I don't remember that. Okay. Anyway, yeah, Lee Pace, who is Orlando Bloom's dad. <gasps> in oh, Hobbit, I didn't pick uh, up on that. Lord of the Rings world. Oh. I don't think a lot of people did in the movies because it's not made clear. There's a lot of familial connections that are not made clear. <laughs> so wait. Other than the dwarves. Gimli is whose child? Dwarfling? Glowing. Glowing. Oh. Glowing. True. Oh, yes. Okay. Glowing. Yes. The will. growing. The fruit of his glowing. Because I will. <laughs> <laughs> so both of you want to be elves? I don't know. I kind of like that hobbit life. Kelly, you love pajamas. I, yeah. I'm currently in pajamas. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but you like creating yeah. things, so would you want to be a dwarf, actually? Because they create a lot of stuff. Well, I don't know. I haven't met any female like dwarves. I don't know if they exist. I don't think so. that they ever talk about female dwarves. I think that's kind of something that's widely debated in the, really? the community about <gasps> what what are female dwarves do they all just have what? beards and they kind of blend in with all of the other ones or do they keep them like down in the mountain and no one ever sees them oh my god is it like a patriarchal asexual or what is it called the fish that like can change their reproductive organs to have a baby i was thinking like worms <laughs> maybe they're like that maybe the dwarves are like just all male and they have babies to keep the dwarves going, and they're just all together, and they're happy. But there's no women. I don't Maybe. know. I'll I answer this question. Me too. <laughs> We're going to have to ask the dwarf community in the, in the mountain. In the Two Towers movie, I remember they talk about it with Eowyn. And Gimli's talking to her about dwarves, and I think he kind of like makes a joke that they have yeah. like beards but yeah it's not really ever kind of clearly explained oh, no so that's interesting no the he does make a joke thickens. he's like he's like are they or do they just have beards like all of us like you'll never know <laughs> yeah anyone's like oh okay i guess i'll i guess i'll leave this conversation <laughs> I don't think yeah. I'd want to be a dwarf they're too angry and i think i'm already too angry enough as a person <laughs> so well, and they have like a one track mind when it comes to like gold and treasure yeah yeah. Also, a part of this book that I thought was really funny is that it's really clear that the dwarves also aren't travelers or mm. adventurers yeah. at all. They complain the whole time. <laughs> they sure do. They're tired. Relatable. They're hungry. They're, things are uncomfortable. They're caring too much. Like They complain the entire time. And also, they don't really have weapons until like oh. later on yeah. they acquire until they weapons. raid the trolls cave right yeah they acquire weapons but before that they just have all of these fucking ridiculous musical instruments that they're <laughs> supposed to bring to <laughs> oh, to yes. bilbo's house like the cellos and stuff like <laughs> yeah. that that's just like okay <laughs> how did they pack for this trip they just thought they were gonna walk poorly one does not simply walk <laughs> oh my god but like, there it is you can't just walk up to a dragon with a loot and be like give me your loot <laughs> see that riddle or not riddle but like <laughs> i sure did golem is that your loot for mine <laughs> did it take you three days to come up with that in the dark <laughs> yes <laughs> oh my gosh speaking about the weapons i was thinking about this it made me laugh so hard so when they get those weapons from the trolls cave and it's like you know goblin crusher and you know uh, orc orcrist is that one of them no or 
Orc something. I remember, yeah. I forget. Anyway, the names of the swords. And then when they they fall into the Goblin King mine area, and all the goblins are, like, rushing at them. And then when Gandalf eventually reveals his sword, and all the goblins who they've never met before are, like, able to remember that they know the sword's name. And I'm like, it's a sword. And they know it's... I, I understand it's, like, a legendary sword. It was just a very funny moment to me in that moment that they were all like, oh, this sword of legend that we all recognize on sight unseen <laughs> and they run away from it <laughs> it's because it's glowing I it's know, glowing it's still funny. or glowing it glows <laughs> it it's glowing yo <laughs> but the reason it glows is because the creators like made, that right it's elf made and not all elvish weapons glow but certain craftsmen are able to pull their feelings and like all of this emotion into the weapons that they're creating. And that's <gasps> what makes them so powerful. So that's why some of them glow and some of them don't. Okay. Well, that's beautiful. Oh my God. Yeah. Nikki. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> it's like I made it on myself. Yeah. Watch that's that. totally fucking lie, and I have to edit and be like, I did make that up myself. <laughs> I didn't. But <laughs> I love. But that. the sword's called Sting. No, no, not not Bilbo's sword. It was the two other ones, the ones that Gandalf and uh, Thorin got. Oh. One of them was named like Orcrist, or and one was like Goblin Crusher, and like mm, here I'll I look. I wish up. I could remember their names. Thorin. Uh, so. Gandalf used Glamdring. Glamdring, yes. And, oh, oh, they called it Beater. And Beater. Thorin had Orcrist, and they called it Orcrist. Biter. Thank <sighs> God it was the same name. Wow, I was, like, really falling apart there. Was Thorin yeah. played by Richard Armitage? Armitage? He sure was. Oh, my God, yes. another hottie patati. Wow. Wow, no kidding. Honestly. I fell in love with him in North and South when I was in high school, and... Knowing that he was playing Thorin Oak and Shield, my heart about burst out of my chest. <laughs> I have a question before we end. Do we ever find out why they chose Bilbo and, like, are hobbits actually good thieves? Or did he just say that? Like, do we think they actually needed Bilbo to go on this quest? Because I don't know if they did. Hot take? <laughs> well, I don't know. They didn't need Bilbo, but they needed the ring, clearly, because... Yeah. They wouldn't have gotten anywhere if he wouldn't have had the ring. That's true. They would have been fucked by the trolls. So basically, like, a hundred pages in. <laughs> but could they not have just, like, killed the trolls? Because there's, like, twelve dwarves, But they were right? all tied up. After. After Bilbo. But they're all on spits. Oh, they're all on spits. yes, yes, yes. And Bilbo's <laughs> invisible. And then Gandalf decides he's going to come back and help out for a little bit. So yes. they would have been eaten and done. That would have... Yeah, um, I think um, it's an interesting question. I think they definitely needed somebody mm -hmm. because dwarves are not sneaky. And I feel like Gandalf had this feeling. I don't know if he's like quite so omniscient as he is portrayed to be in the movies mm -hmm. i did like reading the books that he was like kind of wrong about stuff sometimes and like a little bit more human mm -hmm. but i think he's got a feeling that bilbo needs to be there do you know what i mean okay yeah, yeah. that's what i take from it anyway okay yeah gandalf does get a little bit more um refined in the trilogy then he is in. He was a troll in The Hobbit. He was just trolling everybody. Yeah, he was really, really funny in The Hobbit. <laughs> yeah. I know. He would just run away. I always think about the audiobook that I listened to in the, like, long car rides. And they had, you know, all the music. And they had, like, different voice actors for every character. It was, like, a whole production. But the voice for Gandalf was, like, so not it. It was not the, <laughs> the voice that I wanted. It was like, well, Mr. Hobbit. <laughs> like, it was just very, like, crotchety old man. And not, like, Ian McKellen, which is the standard, I believe. Yes. That's why I really like the Andy Serkis audiobook mm -hmm. because he is doing like as close to Ian McKellen as he can. He does Billy Boyd like perfectly. He oh, does nice. I don't know what the fucking guy's name who who plays Sam almost perfectly. Mm. It's like you're just reading the movie. 
Yeah. Wow. So you you wouldn't even need them to say, oh, said said Pippin or whatever. You wouldn't even need that if you had re- watched the movies a lot because it's so spot on. Yeah. And obviously it's his great. Gollum is perfection because he is Gollum. <laughs> I, I don't know. I thought that. his Gollum yeah. left a little bit to be desired. <laughs> <laughs> and with that... Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the BYOB podcast. If you enjoyed this and want to hear more from us, you can head over to our social media accounts to keep up to date on all things BYOB. We've got Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, the works. We'll be continuing on with our mini series next week, and we'll be releasing an episode every week until September 8th. There's a lot of ground to cover with the Lord of the Rings trilogy, so each book in the main trilogy will be getting two episodes. Stay tuned after this to hear the first line of our next read, The Fellowship of the Ring by J.R.R. Tolkien. See you next time, and until then, keep on drinking in great stories. Cheers! Next time on BYOB, the Bring Your Own Book podcast. When Mr. Bilbo Baggins of Bag End announced that he would shortly be celebrating his 111st birthday with a party of special magnificence, there was much talk and excitement in Hobbiton. (laughs) 